Hi everyone, this is Rebecca Ferreira and I'm going to be recording an introduction to the cosmological argument for you today. And there's a lot to get through, so I'm going to start with Thomas Aquinas and then we'll see how far we get. If um, it ends up going on too long, I'll break this up into a couple different videos uh, so that it doesn't get too overwhelming. So let's get started here. First with a quick review of some terminology that was introduced at the end of week one in our introduction to philosophy of religion PowerPoint. Uh, these terms are helpful not only for understanding what kind of being it is that is being argued for, right, when we say that we're arguing for the existence of a being like God, but also how those types of arguments are going to have to involve different types of support than, say, arguing for the existence for a human being or an animal or something that we can um, empirically verify. All right, so to review these terms, right, we are talking about different types of beings. And first, we want to classify that all of the beings that we can empirically confirm exist, at least to the extent of our knowledge, are what we would classify as contingent beings, meaning that beings that did not have to exist, right? So for example, you and I exist contingently, right? We did not have to exist. Um, there are many things that could have gone differently which would have resulted in our not existing, right? And more technically speaking, a contingent being is one whose existence is not necessitated by the nature of the being itself. So for example, there is nothing in the definition of what it means to be human that entails that human beings must exist, right? It's not a uh, part of what it means to be human to have to exist. So that means that it is log it's also logically possible for contingent beings to have not existed, right? That doesn't create a sort of logical inconsistency, okay? So we can understand that in the actual sense, right? That a being did not have to exist, right? Or it could have not existed as well as the logical sense. Okay, and so in the logical sense, if we wanted to see if it was a being that was contingent or not, we can say if we were to deny its existence, would that imply a contradiction? And so if denying the existence of a being does not imply a contradiction, for example, like in the case of humans, right, we could say it is possible that we did not exist, doesn't create a contradiction, which demonstrates that we are contingent beings. Okay, so this is in contraposition to the other type of being, which we aren't even sure if such beings do exist, right? But um, theoretically, right, if there were a different type of being, something that was different than a contingent being, it would have to exist necessarily, right? That is, it would have been impossible for this type of being to not exist. And there is some debate as to what such a being would be like. And this is where we end up seeing the association between a necessary being and the concept of a supernatural or divine entity like God. Now you are gonna see in some of the rebuttals to the cosmological and other arguments, the idea that perhaps other types of beings could exist necessarily, like perhaps the universe itself exists necessarily, right? That it had to exist, it couldn't have not existed. That's not a very common view, right? But um, many people could, could make that point. But generally speaking, the only necessary being, right, that is typically being referred to is something like a religious conception of the divine or the supernatural, okay? And so in this case, technically speaking, denying the existence of a necessary being would imply a contradiction. And we'll get into um, more of how that works next week when we start looking at the ontological argument. Um, so the idea there is that we can somehow infer that God exists simply by the meaning of the word, right? And this has to do with um, our attributes for God's existence, which we covered last week, which stem from the idea that God, whatever else it means, at least refers to an all-perfect being, right? And then it, God being all-perfect implies these other attributes like omnipotence, omni omnibenevolence, and so forth, right? And so an all-perfect being, the idea is, would have to exist, right? Because if uh, an all-perfect being did not exist, well, then that would create a contradiction because then something else that did exist, say me, right, would be greater or more perfect than this all-perfect being because the idea is that existence is better than non-existence, right? So existing in the real world is somehow greater or more perfect than simply existing as an idea. And so if God, 
only exists in my mind, right? Then God couldn't be an all perfect being, but that's what the meaning of the word God is. And hence we have a contradiction. Okay. So again, that's more of the technical stuff and we'll get into that next week, right? But the idea here is that typically we understand God or perhaps in some cases the universe as a type of being that must exist. It is impossible for it to have not existed. Okay. And so this leads us into a general introduction to the arguments for God's existence, which we are going to categorize based on the types of premises they have. And so this is useful because, as you'll see, even though we're going to have categories like the cosmological argument or the teleological argument, you will notice, in fact, though, that there are many versions of the cosmological argument. And so it will be helpful to know how to classify different arguments that you encounter as certain types based on uh, certain identifying characteristics. And so we're going to learn how to categorize them as such. So the first set of categories of arguments we're going to refer to as a posteriori arguments. Now, um, if you haven't realized already, philosophers have a bit of a preference for Latin. Um, and so what this means is post here refers to after. And so these are arguments whose premises are based upon things that we know only after we've experienced them in the world. Okay, so this is a term that you would come across in epistemology. We'll see it again when we get to religious epistemology. But a posteriori simply refers to truths or things that we can know, right? A proposition that could be that is true or that we could know, but only that we could know after experiencing something in the world. So for example, Right? If you were to take a proposition like, um, you know, there is a global pandemic going on, you couldn't know whether or not that proposition was true without going out into the world and finding out, right? We couldn't just know just by thinking about, you know, our background knowledge whether or not that's the case. We actually have to have experiences. We have to observe certain phenomena. Right? And so a posteriori arguments start off with premises that require experience and observation. Now this is interesting because many people think that there is no observation or empirical evidence or experience that could prove that God exists. Right, So these, this category of arguments is going to presume that we actually can infer God's existence from things that are observable in the world. Right, And so the cosmological argument is going to be the first category of a posteriori arguments we look at. Right, These work from facts about the universe's existence, again, specifically uh, referring back to our terminology. These observations involve um, observing that the universe itself is contingent, right? And so there, the idea is that it relies on something else for its existence. And what we'll see is that um, people who argue in the cosmological argument are going to say that that causal chain, right, whatever causal chain of events brought about the existence of the universe could not have gone backwards infinitely, right? There must have been a first cause, right? And then the idea is that, that there's something about the nature of that first cause which must be different from the contingent beings, right, that result from that chain, right, the universe being the thing that we started from, okay, it's a contingent being. So if we go back through that chain of causes, well, the first cause couldn't also be contingent, so it must be necessary, and the idea, again, is that if it's necessary, it must be God, right? Similarly, in the teleological argument, which we'll also look at next week, is the idea that we can observe, in this case, not contingency, but purposeful design in the universe. Okay, So a different observation, but an observation nonetheless, which makes it a posteriori. And instead of involving a denial of an infinite regress, teleological arguments we're going to see will use a strategy called argument from analogy, where the idea is that by looking at something that exhibits design in the human world, say like looking at a watch, we can infer from that design the existence of an intelligent designer, right? And so by analogy, oh, well, we observe intelligent, or I'm sorry, we observe purpose in the universe, so we can also infer the existence of an intelligent universe maker, right? An intelligent designer of the universe. But of course, right, the universe is far greater than something human made, like a watch, so the universe creator must be far more powerful and hence this is the implication that it is God. Okay, so you can see how we're starting off from a posteriori 
uh, Ori observations and then moving to argue for God's existence from them. The other type of category is the one that gets a little bit more technical with uh, definitions and meanings, like I was mentioning before, and these are called a priori arguments. Here, the root word of the Latin is prior, so just like post meant after experience, a priori means prior to experience. Or in other words, these are truths or propositions that can be known without having to go out into the world and experience anything without having to make any empirical observations. Simply through reason alone, we can arrive at the truth of these types of things. For example, if I were to give you the proposition that all bachelors are unmarried men, you should know that that proposition is true, not because you have gone out into the world and checked all the bachelors to make sure that they're all single, but as long as you know that the definition of the word bachelor means to be a single man, right, or an unmarried man, then you know that it must be true that all bachelors are unmarried men, right? Just by thinking about it, okay? And so this is a really interesting class of arguments as well, even though they don't work from empirical observation, which is highly prized by many, this idea again that perhaps by the definition of the meaning of the word God, we can argue that God exists not necessarily. And this, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be the ontological argument that we look at next week. All right. There are some other arguments for God's existence that we will come across throughout the class. Um, these are more inductive, and so we don't categorize them in those other uh, categories as those other arguments tend to be formulated deductively to the, uh, as best as they can. So the first inductive argument for God's existence that we're going to consider later on in the quarter is called inference to the best explanation, or for short, IBE. Inference to the best explanation is used pretty much all the time. You probably use it throughout your everyday life and don't even realize it. We use it in science all the time, right? It's basically the idea that we are observing a phenomenon, so it's a posteriori in that sense, but now we want to try to figure out what the best explanation for that phenomenon is. And this is where we start to encounter arguments for God's existence that are based not just off of observations, Right? but off of a series of inferences that try to eliminate other possible explanations such that the only um, option left is that God must be the explanation, right? And if God is the best explanation, well, then God must exist, right? And so these tend to be based on, right, observations of phenomena which are, again, after eliminating other possibilities, presumed to be miracles, right, as well as other types of religious experiences. Okay, so arguments for, uh, for miracles or religious experience right, are inductive and use that inference to the best explanation. So we'll look at that later in the quarter. The last set of arguments that we're going to look at in this class that deal with God's existence is actually going to be a set that is the only kind of argument against God's existence. And this is worth um, a small note because it is actually, <laughs> when you think about it, pretty impossible to determine or argue or prove that something doesn't exist, right? Because any lack of evidence would be evidence for that, but we all know that a lack of evidence for something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? Because then we would have reason to think that nothing existed unless it was in our line of sight at the present moment. Okay, so it's very difficult to argue against the existence for something. So this is the one class of arguments that attempts to argue against God's existence, and it comes in the form of the problem or argument from evil. And this has to do with three specific attributes of God that we encountered last week. Specifically the idea that from the notion that God is all perfect, we can infer that God must also be all powerful, all knowing, and all good. Now, these three attributes are going to create the problem of evil as we will see when we get to that section. But the idea is that if God knows when evil is going to occur, could stop it, and I write if, it's, if God is all good would want to stop it, then evil should not occur. But of course, evil, if we take uh, the simplest definition of it as something like suffering, right? Evil, at least in that sense, clearly does occur. And so the idea is that this house somehow threatens the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good God. And since, in at least the um, Abrahamic monotheistic religions, 
people aren't really willing to give up any of those attributes, right? They're not willing to say, well, okay, God's not all powerful, or God's not all knowing, or okay, God's good, but also evil. Since religious individuals tend not to be willing to make those types of concessions, right, just to deal with a logical problem, then the idea is that, well, since these are incompatible, you, must, you need to deny the existence of God, because clearly evil exists. And if they can't go together, we must deny the existence of the other. And as we'll see, there is a deductive version of this, which says that they are, in fact, logically incompatible. But there's also an inductive version, known as the evidential version. And this says, well, look, maybe evil or the existence of evil is compatible in some way with this type of God. But the idea is that there's so much unnecessary evil in the world that it makes the existence of this particular type of God very unlikely, right? So we have, a, a, again, a deductive as well as an inductive version that we'll take a look at. But um, just so you know, when we get to the problem of evil, we're also going to be looking at responses, just as we will to all of these, um, right? In philosophy, it's not only about putting forth an argument, but entertaining criticisms as well as learning how to respond to them. So we'll be taking a look at all that. All right, so this leads us into Thomas Aquinas and the five ways. So this is probably the most renowned um, and well-known set of formulations of the cosmological argument, right? And so is worth getting to uh, taking a look at. But just to clarify again, right? These are five different versions of what would count as cosmological arguments, right? So they're all arguing for the same thing. They're just going to use different, uh, in this case, Aquinas is going to make five, right, specific different observations that will lead him not only to conclude, right, that there was a first cause, but again, that that first cause was God. And so we're going to take a look at the general structure of all of these five ways, and then we'll look at each one of them individually. And then we're going to focus in on the third way, which utilizes a strategy of reasoning known as reductio ad absurdum that we'll need to talk about for our writing assignment, as well as just uh, to ensure you have an understanding of, of how this strategy works. So. Start off with a little bit about Thomas Aquinas. I'll let you take a look at him. But just to give you an overview of his bio, um, the interesting thing about what you're reading is that these were not written for, the, um, for an audience of atheists. So in other words, these arguments were never meant to convince a non-believer to believe in God. Instead, he wrote these as sort of a study manual for priests who were training in theology. And the idea was that, um, you know, a good priest will need to be able to answer um, any questions or doubts that members of their flock will have. And so these are some arguments, right, and some elements of reasoning and some philosophical thought to help you answer those questions, right? So instead of requiring, you know, every priest to, you know, be able to conjure up new justifications for, I'm sure, questions that many religious people have, right? Sort of like, uh, okay, if they ask this question, right, you can look to this answer. So, so just know that if you find these unsatisfactory in any way, they were never meant to convince someone who didn't already believe in God. They meant to help justify those beliefs when those beliefs came up against potential criticism or certain doubts. All right, so the identifying characteristics of each of these five ways include three main components. And I'm going to set up the other arguments for God's existence in a similar way just to help you compare. So first, as I've already mentioned, right, cosmological arguments are a posteriori, so they're going to start off with an a posteriori observation. Then the second and probably the most identifying characteristic of a cosmological argument is the fact that at some point in the argument, the uh, arguer or the philosopher will assert that an infinite regress, right, so that again, that backwards causal chain cannot go back infinitely forever, right, so it has to have had a first cause. And the idea again is that that first cause must have been different, otherwise it too would require an explanation, right, and then we're back in the infinite regress. So. At some point in the argument, if a denial of something like an infinite regress of justification or causes or whatever, if that's denied, you probably know you're looking or dealing with a cosmological argument, right? Trying to establish the first cause in that set, okay? The other interesting marker of not just Aquinas' arguments, but uh, we'll see again when we get to the teleological argument as well, is that 
Aquinas doesn't actually conclude with a deductively valid proof for God's existence. What he does is he is able to provide a deductively valid proof for the existence of a necessary being. But then, if you did the reading, you'll see that he makes this weird sort of addition at the end where he says, and we all understand this to be God. So I call this the uh, natural theologian jump. Again, uh, you can take a look at that intro to philosophy of religion PowerPoint for the difference between philosophy of religion and theology. But the idea here is that Aquinas used philosophical reasoning all the way to his conclusion, and then he just kind of jumps from his asserted conclusion, a justifiable one, to the claim that we all know this to be God. And he has not given us any reason to do that, right? That would be a move that would be unjustified in logic and in philosophy. So, you know, that's going to be a potential worry. But we still need to understand, right, and assess the other components of the argument as well. So if we were to elaborate on those three components, right, in our premises again, we're going to start off with certain observations a posteriori about the world. Again, in cosmological arguments, these observations tend to focus on something about the contingent nature of the universe, right, to set it apart from something like a necessary being. Then again, that denial of an infinite regress, okay, so if, if the universe is contingent and it was caused by something contingent and something contingent before that, well, that chain of contingent beings can't go on forever into the past. So there must have been a first being. Well, that being couldn't have been contingent because it too would have required an explanation. So it must have been necessary, right? So it must be different. And what is the only necessary being that we know, right? We understand it to be God. All right, so the idea again is that Aquinas is going to use the same structure, but he's going to be making five different observations. So I'm not going to spend too much time going through all five of them, right? You can go through later. I'm just going to go through them really quick. Right? But his five observations are these. The first one has to do with observing motion, right? And so the idea is that a chain of motion cannot go back infinitely, so there must have been a first mover. But again, that first mover must have been different, so it's the unmoved mover. Number two, chain of cause and effect has to have been a first cause, but the first cause cannot be caused like everything else, so it's the quote unquote uncaused cause, right? This People love philosophy. It gets ridiculous like this. <laughs> Three is a contingency. We're going to dive deeper into that with the reductio, as I mentioned. The fourth one is actually more of a sense of an infinite regress in a vertical sense, not linear, like in the sense of time and causal connection, but vertical in the sense of comparing something to something that is more perfect, right? So the idea is that every conception of perfection we have right, came from something more perfect, there has to have been a most perfect thing, right, and that must be God. The fifth one is actually kind of sneakily, I'll give you a hint, not really a cosmological argument, even though because it was given by Aquinas and was kind of structured in the same way, it's been included. But this one is really closer to what we're going to label as a teleological argument because it has to do with being able to, again, observe intelligent design, or in this case, what he describes of as harmony in the universe, and then ascribing the creation of that harmony to some intelligent being. So that one doesn't really follow as much as the other ones do, but it is included as a cosmological argument nonetheless. All right, so again, take a look at each of these in a little bit more clarity. I've given you some abbreviated versions here. Um, I think I've also attached much more lengthy versions of these put into standard form um, in Canvas, so please take a look at that if you'd like. But at this point, I want to, like I mentioned, focus on the third way. So here we go, another Latin word, reductio ad absurdum. But hopefully, again, this too should um, be pretty clear because it's pretty close to what it is in English. It means reduce to absurdity. So this is a particular strategy for arguing against someone if you're unable to directly criticize their point of view, right? So it's a sort of indirect way of making your case. So the strategy first off involves assuming the opposite of what you want to show. So in this case, we know that Thomas Aquinas wants to argue that necessary beings exist, or at least one necessary being, right? God, because he's a monotheist, okay? So he wants to argue that a necessary being exists. Well, 
we know at least that some contingent beings exist, right? The universe he thinks is contingent, but maybe we can't directly argue for the existence of a necessary being, right? Maybe that's too difficult. So this strategy is to indirectly argue it by showing that by presuming the opposite of what we want to show, that that presumption implies something absurd and so actually ought to be rejected. So again, Aquinas wants to show that there exists at least one necessary being. So the opposite of that would be that there exists no necessary beings, right? So this would mean that we should just assume that everything that exists is contingent, right? There's no necessary beings, okay? So again, this is a strategy. This is not what Aquinas believes. Okay, so let's assume that every being is contingent. This is basically like saying, let's assume there's no God. Okay, so from that, for every contingent being, we would know by the nature of what it means to be contingent that those things once did not exist. Thus, it is impossible for these beings to have always existed. Okay, that again follows from the definition. So, if it's impossible for all these contingent beings to have always existed, then there could have been a time when no things existed. At that time, when no things existed, there would have been nothing to bring the currently existing things into existence. So, for in other words, if there was a time when there was nothing, there would never have been anything to create the first thing. Okay? And that would mean that nothing would exist now. That is obviously absurd. So do you see how this works? He has assumed the opposite of what he wants to show on premise two. He has shown that by assuming that, it implies something totally outrageous that is unacceptable, and that means that we should reject the assumption. Okay? So not every being is contingent, therefore some being must exist necessarily, and this we understand to be God. All right, so this is a useful strategy, again, if you are unable to directly critique someone's view or directly argue for something, right, you can use this indirect method. It's also important to understand because you will have to construct a reductio against yourself when we get to the objections part of our writing assignment. Okay, so moving on from this, right, there's a positive formulation in the regular case if you want to compare, and then again, another overview of the cosmological argument. So uh, normally when I teach this in class, what I would do is have you spend some time looking at each line of this argument and trying to imagine how you could object to it. And the reason that I'm going to ask you to uh, consider doing this on your own is because this is, again, good philosophical practice. Not because we disagree with every line, but because, again, we need to imagine what those objections might be such that we can defend against them. Okay, so in order to assess the strength of Aquinas' arguments, we have to critique them, right? Even if we do agree with them. So we need to put ourselves in the position of someone else. So for example, I want you to think about how someone could potentially criticize premise one, right? Now certainly dependent beings exist, but again, he's really focused on the presumption that the universe is a dependent being. So again, maybe you want to say, well, why couldn't the universe be necessary for premise two? Here we have an either or, right? Either that dependent being is going to be caused by an infinite regress of other dependent beings or by a finite chain that starts with God. Okay, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. Now, if you recall from the um, uh, intro to the class materials as well, you would have noticed uh, some information about fallacious reasoning. Now, one potential worry whenever someone gives you an either or is that they might be presenting you with a false dilemma, right? How do we know that these are the only two options? So that might be a potential worry for premise two. And it would be even better if we could think of another option. Premise three, right? Denying one of the options in premise two. We're saying it's not because of an infinite series, right? He's denying an infinite regress. Well, if any of you are interested, I would encourage you to look up some criticisms, right, of this denial. A lot of people think that infinite regresses are incredibly plausible. And if you have studied statistics at all, you understand that an infinite series can exist within a finite set, right? So there's all sorts of interesting philosophical things that go along with the notion of infinity that could potentially challenge Aquinas' assumption, really, just that an infinite regress is impossible.
okay? And then finally, right, that natural theologian jump at the end, clearly there are problems with presuming that we all understand not only that necessary being to be God, but also to presume in the case of Aquinas that for him it is the monotheistic conception of God, and in this case the Abrahamic conception. You know, who says that that conception of God is the correct one? Uh, as we're going to see with David Hume and some other criticisms, why does it only have to be one God that exists, right? Couldn't there be many necessary beings, right? Couldn't there be many gods? Also, even again, if there is a necessary being or God, does that being still have to exist? Maybe it just set everything in motion at the beginning, but maybe it isn't the personal God that is, uh, you know, m m said to exist in the Abrahamic religion. So again, we want to get into this idea of asking these questions, even if we agree with what's being said, such that we can assess the strengths and weak weaknesses, know how to make it better, or know what changes need to be made moving forward. All right, so I've gone over some of these different objections or potential problems, which each line of the argument here, we're going to get into some more of these later, um, or they'll be uh, elaborated on in the readings. But of course, if you have any questions about them, please don't hesitate to let me know. All right.